हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a senior librarian and a woman interested in working at the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Um I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down, but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects? Right. But I don't know if I have the right skills. Well, we do provide training. Oh. We always include an orientation to the library together with emergency procedures. That's fire regulations, emergency exits, first aid so you can cope with accidents or sudden illness. Things like that which are necessary for anyone who's working with the public. Then we give specialist training for particular projects like using our database system. I do have quite good computer skills in fact. Oh, great. Is there any sort of uh, dress requirement? Well, all staff have to wear a name badge so they can be identified if they go outside the staff only areas. But apart from that, there aren't many regulations. We ask you to sign in and sign out for insurance purposes, but that's all. How about transport? Do you live locally? Well, not too far away. I'm at Porpoise Beach. My husband needs a car during the day, but it's only about 20 minutes on the bus. In fact, we can reimburse part of your travel expenses in that case. Oh. Would that be the same if I came by car? No, uh, because parking is such a problem here. One thing we are looking for though is someone who can drive a minibus. No problem. So, do the projects involve going outside the library? Some, yes, but not all. We've just finished one which involved working with photographs taken of the area 50 or 100 years ago. It basically involved what we call encapsulation. Putting them in some sort of covers to keep them safe? Exactly. <laughs> It's time-consuming work and we were very grateful to have help with it. Then sometime next year we're hoping to begin working on an initiative involving the sorting and labeling of objects relating to local history. We'll be needing help with the cataloging. Well, I definitely be interested. How about at present? Well, we have a small team who work to support those who are unable to read. Working with the blind? Yes, or other groups who have reading difficulties. We provide volunteers with equipment so that they can take books home with them and read them aloud onto CDs. We're gradually building up a collection that can be lent to those who need them. Mm, I can see it would be useful, but I'd really like to do some sort of work where I can get the chance to meet people. How about reading stories to children? Mm, that's done by our regular staff, but we do have another project. It's a very long established scheme which involves helping those who are unable to have direct access to the library. Oh, I noticed someone with a trolley of books when I was at the hospital last week. That sort of thing. That would have been one of ours, yes. It's one of our most popular services. Lots of people who wouldn't dream of going to the library normally or when they're at home borrow a book when the trolley comes round the ward. I can imagine. <laughs> Yes, I'd definitely be interested in that. 
Right, so how do I enrol? Well, we do ask all volunteers to commit themselves to a regular period each week. I could probably do five or six hours. Oh, be careful not to take on too much. But we do need someone for a couple of afternoons from two to four. So four hours altogether. That sounds fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Right, so here's the application form. It asks the usual questions, name and address and telephone number. You also need to fill in details of who we should get in touch with in case of any accident or problem like that. Uh, we do need to have that filled in. And there's a space for date of birth, but that's only if you're over 75, so uh, we won't worry about that. No. <laughs> oh, it asks for qualifications. Do I need to provide certificates? They're not necessary. We'll need the names of two referees, not relatives or family members, obviously. Uh, what else? Signature of parent or guardian. <laughs> that won't be necessary, as I assume you're over 18. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's this? It says civil conviction check. That's a document we have to provide by law for those working on projects involving children, so we won't need it in your case. But you will need to sign this separate document. That's a, a copy of commitment. It's basically an agreement to work according to the library guidelines. So, if you'd like to fill this all in, oh, you can do it here or take it home, whichever you prefer. I'll take it home if that's OK. Right, well, thank you for your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the information roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, this is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000 and it's likely to grow unless we do something. And it's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. 
It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90 percent? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear a conversation between two students, Lynn and Robin, who are discussing an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. That essay we have to write, the one on how children learn through the media, how are you planning to write it? Well, I've given it some thought, and I think that the best way to approach it is to divide the essay into two parts. First of all, we'd have to look at some examples of each type of media. Yes, what they are. Then we could describe how we can use each medium so that children can learn something from each one. Exactly. 
Maybe we could draw up a table and look at examples of each medium in turn. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Um, the different forms of media would be the print media. You need of things like books and newspapers, that sort of thing. Hmm. And included in these are the pictorial forms of print media, like maps. Yes. Maps are really just formal pictures, aren't they? Hmm. And then there are what we call the audio forms of media where children can listen. Mm -hmm. CDs and radios are probably the best examples because a lot of children have access to these, especially radios. And this would lead into the audio-visual media, mm. which can be seen as well as heard. Uh, film, television, uh, and we mustn't forget videos. Yes, but there's a final category as well. Computers mm -hmm. that make up the so-called electronic media. In the United Kingdom and Australia, they say that one in three families has a computer now. Yes, I believe it. Well, uh, that's a good list to start with. We're really getting somewhere with this essay now. Hmm. So let's move on to when each type of medium could be used. I guess we could start by trying to identify the best situation for each type of media. What do you mean? I I'm talking about whether each medium should be used with different size groups. For example, we could look at pictures and ask whether they're more useful for an individual child, a few children together, or a full class. In this case, I'd say pictures are best with individual children because they give them an opportunity to let their imaginations run wild. Yes, I see. Let's take tapes next. Although tapes look ideal for individual children, I feel they're best suited to small group work. Mm. This way, children don't feel isolated, because they can get help from their friends. The computers are the same. I think they're better with small numbers of children, and they're hardly ever useful with a whole class. Videos, however, are ideal for use with everyone present in the class, especially when children have individual activity sheets to help them focus their minds on what's in the video. And what about books? What would you recommend for them? Books are ideal for children to use by themselves. Mm. I know they're used with groups in schools, but I wouldn't recommend it. Other pictorial media, like maps, though, are different. I'd always plan group work around those. Mm. Give the children a chance to interact and to share ideas. Mm, I agree. Teachers often just leave maps on the wall for children to look at when they have some free time. But kids really enjoy using them for problem solving. Yes. Different people have different ideas, I suppose. Yeah, and different teachers recommend different tools for different age groups. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk about whale migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to continue our investigation into the use of technology in plotting oceanographic migratory patterns. And I'd like to focus specifically on creatures that we didn't even realize existed until very recently. Pygmy blue whales. In particular, I'd like to talk about a high-tech method of tracking that researchers have used to find out more about these creatures. Pygmy blue whales 
which are one of several subspecies of blue whales, spend their lives in the vast expanses of the Indian and Southern Pacific Oceans. They were first identified as a distinct subspecies in 1966. Before then, they were probably confused with the Antarctic, or true blue whale, so it's only recently that researchers have started to learn about them and their migrations to and from their breeding and feeding grounds. Scientists are interested in pygmy blue whales because, although they are a very mobile subspecies, very little is known about their movements and their populations. Large-scale movements of whales are particularly hard to study, and what we do know about pygmy blue whales, we've mainly learned from examining whaling records. There are several populations of pygmy blue whales in the southern hemisphere, and two main feeding grounds off southern and western Australia. Scientists were interested in testing their hypothesis that the pygmy blue whales feeding off Western Australia migrate to Indonesia to breed. To track the whales' movements, researchers made use of something called satellite telemetry. This refers to the use of a satellite-linked tag attached to a whale. When the antenna on the whale breaks the surface of the water, the tag communicates with the satellite system. The location of the whale can be determined when multiple satellites receive the tag's transmissions, much like how the navigation system works on a mobile phone. Researchers receive this location data in almost real time via the project website, which allows them to track the movement of the tagged whale from many miles away. The use of these tags has enabled researchers to discover that pygmy blue whales do indeed travel northwards from the west coast of Australia in March and April, reaching the warmer breeding grounds of Indonesia in June. They remain there until September, at which time they then return to Australian waters. In addition to identifying the migratory pattern of this particular population of pygmy whales, researchers also shone new light on the whales' feeding patterns. It's usually assumed that whales go without food outside of the summer when they leave their feeding grounds. But interestingly, the pygmy blue whales studied travel from productive feeding grounds off Western Australia to productive areas in Indonesia, and therefore probably still have the opportunity to feed whilst they're in their breeding grounds. It is hoped that mapping the migratory movements of the pygmy whales will help conservation efforts for these endangered animals. And the study has enabled researchers to identify specific conservation issues. For example, the migratory routes of pygmy blue whales correspond closely with shipping routes. Consequently, researchers are keen to monitor whether this has any negative effects on the whale's behaviour. Baleen whales, these are whales that use filters to feed, not teeth, use sounds to communicate and to gain information about their environment. Clearly, as pygmy blue whale movements correspond to shipping routes, there is potential for the noise generated by ships to affect communication and hence social encounters and feeding. Previously, researchers could only hypothesise that pygmy blue whales occupying Western Australian waters travelled into Indonesian waters. Now that this hypothesis has been borne out by evidence, conservation efforts can be undertaken in a wider area than just Australian waters. However, scientists aren't stopping here. A question mark still remains over the movements of the pygmy blue whales that utilise the feeding grounds further south, off the southern coast of Australia. Genetic evidence indicates that there is a mixing taking place between the population of whales in the feeding grounds of Western Australia and the population further south. Researchers are keen to discover whether the pygmy whales from the southern feeding grounds follow a similar migration route to those from the west coast, or whether they migrate to the subtropical region to the south of Australia. As a result, there are plans to tag the pygmy blue whales further south in order to find out whether they move through the same areas as the western population and are therefore exposed to the same risks. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
so guys don't forget like subscribe and share my youtube channel and my facebook page i'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent ielts exam writing us topics listening reading practice test and speaking you cut guesswork please guys participate in everyday new ielts listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual ielts exam for more ielts material visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com the link is given below in the description if you need pdf files of latest ielts material then please join my telegram channel so guys please write your score below the comment section again thanks for listening god bless you all guys stay tuned stay safe